Um, I'm Stephanos Polizoides, Dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Notre Dame. It is an honor and a great personal pleasure to be welcoming Laurie Olin to our school today. Uh, Laurie is the most distinguished landscape architect teaching and practicing in the US. He has been a professor at Penn for almost 50 years and served as chair of the landscape department at Harvard. His drawings, his ideas and projects have been published widely, both here and, and abroad. He is also the founding principal of the Olin Partnership, a leading landscape office that is located in Philadelphia. The partnership has been involved in design at every scale from private gardens to parks and plazas, streetscapes and campuses. They were also pioneers in conceptualizing and executing projects that involve both urban and environmental design at the grand scale beginning almost three decades ago. The Olin Partnership's work is truly exemplary and I urge you to search it out on the internet and to study it very carefully. There are, there are various countries, uh, most notably Japan, that consider uh, their outstanding elder humanists and designers as national treasures. If the, if the US had such an appreciation for people <laughs> who have expanded the sense of our humanity and its connection to our urban and natural environment, then Laurie would most certainly be a living treasure living among us. He would smile or even laugh if you heard him laughing by, when I said that. But he, he certainly would, 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 would be certainly a living treasure. Um, he also happens to be a personal friend and an architect whose awesome insights and skills I've had the privilege of witnessing firsthand as a in many projects. Uh, welcome, Laurie, to Notre Dame. We're looking forward to your presentation and to engaging you with questions following. Onward. Well, thank you, Stefano. This is a very wonderful and gracious uh, introduction. And uh, it's nice to be able to share my thoughts tonight with some of you at Notre Dame. Um, I'm going to begin by pointing out that you see this funny title, Disegno equals design. Well, Disegno is the Italian word for both drawing and design, and it carries a, a complex um, uh, meaning in art and architecture involving both the ability to make a drawing and the intellectual capacity to invent a design. And these two activities have been considered linked from the Renaissance times on, um, and I think for a very good reason. Uh, now what do I do? Okay, there we go. Well, drawing is one of man's oldest cultural achievements, as you probably know, and along with music, which began about 35,000 years ago, long before there is any written language. And while there is a debate regarding the meaning and purpose of remarkable drawings such as these and many others in the cave of the Dordogne in France and elsewhere in Europe or in Africa and Asia, there's no question of their superb draftsmanship and their intense observation, their accuracy in life and their striking contemporaneity. From, from that time to, let's also say that almost everyone draws in their early years as a child. And the nature of the drawing is remarkably similar and powerful in its presentation of the world and their imagination. Generally today, however, most people stop drawing sometime early in elementary school, in large part because there seems to be no utility for it, unlike speech and other skills. This was true long before the development of computers and the digital media. Some few, however, continue to draw, but mostly only those who are interested in art or design, which has led to a long history of drawing and representation in Western society. This is a drawing by Claude Lorrain, one of the, a number of artists who developed plein air drawing and painting directly from nature in the 17th century. This ink and wash drawing was made about 1640 in the Vigna Madonna, Madama, a, a Medici property just north of the Vatican in Rome. Now, Drawing has been utilized for centuries by many individuals interested in analytical study of sorts. Here's studies of the dynamic flow of water and of human anatomy by Leonardo da Vinci from the 15th century. They're examples of patiently looking long and hard as much as they are of anything like drawing and technique. Drawing has been employed for all manner of identification and explication, and it's often preferred even in medicine today as being more clear and useful than photography. Recent articles have remarked upon the fact that medical schools such as Harvard and Drexel universities have recently begun offering drawing courses to their medical students as a means of helping them become more observant 
literally to be able to see more carefully than the people who don't draw. Which brings us to the notion that sketching and drawing is a way of seeing and of knowing, of slowing oneself down long enough to perceive something carefully, to analyze and to think about it instead of to be literally be there. These are pages from a sketchbook of the 19th century painter Eugene Delacroix from a trip he took to North Africa that changed his life and art, leading to some of the most remarkable paintings afterwards. Here's an example on the left of one of those sketches and how later he used it for the recumbent figure of the woman on the left in the famous painting, Demoiselle d'Algiers, which is now hanging in the Louvre. The habit of artists to use quick, inexpensive sketches and drawings on paper as preliminary studies and tests for larger, more time-consuming and ambitious works is so familiar that we don't think much about it. There are at least a dozen of these Conte crayon studies, like the one on the left by Seurat that he made for the famous painting of the Sunday afternoon crowd on the Grand Jatte that hangs now in the Chicago Art Institute. Even some of the most radical and modern artists of recent times have kept sketchbooks to record and develop their ideas, as well as to make notes when studying the work of other artists that they admire. These are examples from some of Picasso's many sketchbooks. On the left, we see him <laughs> trying out ideas for paintings. And, on, and in that, you can see there. And on the far left is his interpretation of one of the women in the Delacroix painting we just saw. Next to it, turning the sketchbook 90 degrees, he made a quick sketch for a painting representing his own studio. And the two pages on the right are another sketchbook showing him doodling around with motifs that are a combination of abstractions of furniture, vases, and a torso. While on the facing page, he's looking very carefully at a Rembrandt portrait of a man in a helmet. Now, drawings in the form of illustrations for texts have existed since the end of the Roman Empire, accompanying religious tracts such as the Bible, and they've persisted into the era of novelistic fiction of Dickens and Thackeray, Goethe's plays, and by the 19th century into journalism. Winslow Homer, later famous as a painter, submitted drawings for Eastern periodicals during the Civil War. And with the birth of film, the early animation productions of Walt Disney and others, here you see, you know, uh, the, the drawings that then became a vehicle for the narrative, for argumenting, augment, just they not only augmented the text, they replaced the text. Here we go, you can see John Tenniel's famous 19th century illustration of the Mad Hatter's Tea Party from Alice in Wonderland and drawings, sketches, early studies for the Sorcerer's Apprentice portion of Disney's first full length 1938 film, Fantasia. Now the Disney studios pioneered the notion of creating images through a series of overlays of different visual information. Here's a scene from Bambi, which could then be photographed as a composite image. And this overlapping, overlaying of techniques later was applied in landscape architecture, then in planning and analysis, and then it found its way into computer applications and eventually into architecture. Even today, however, despite recent developments in digital technology and software, which are remarkable, the folks at Pixar, who are arguably one of the most advanced commercial animation studios in the world, they begin and develop all of their work through drawing, examples of which are these preparatory sketches and a storyboard portion for their digitally animated feature film, Ratatouille. Another example of these storyboard setups, here's some from Studio Ghibli in Japan from one of the most famous of all the anime film ever, Princess Mononoke. This reinforces the indispensable potential of the ability to draw from one's imagination and how it continues to be useful despite all the digital and computational tools that we may have at our disposal. So how about architecture? Well, again, there's a very long tradition of drawing. We often think of the use of measured plans and sections as a near magical project product of the Italian Renaissance, as in this plan by Antonio Sangallo the Younger for the Palazzo Farnese at Caparola. But in fact, the use of measured drawings for design and construction of buildings is much, much older. Here's a scale drawing of an elevation of a lintel on columns framing a doorway of a temple made in ink on papyrus in the eighth dynasty of Egypt. 
look carefully and you can see the shape of moldings and of a doorway with the attached capitals and lintel with a proposed carved ornament of the sun in the center of the lintel. It's true, however, that by the 16th century, most of the conventions that we still employ for describing buildings in three-dimensional spaces and structures had been developed. These are two studies of the fabric of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, a partial plan below of the central apse and the attendant piers of the crossing that supports the dome, and then seen in a cutaway three-dimensional perspective above, both of these are drawings by Peruzzi. Well, not only were measured plans used to construct models for building design from which to work, but also these architects used freehand sketches and drawings to develop their ideas for all of the aspects of their structures working in section, elevation, plans, and perspective sketches, imagining particular intersections, working out the relationship of the parts, the structural systems, the geometry, and the ornament. Now, conventions of representation developed that became a universal means of description and communication at this period were widespread. This is a drawing by the great 17th century landscape architect, Andre Lenotre, for one of the fountain basins at Versailles, and it combines a partial plan with a vertical axonometric view of the basin surrounding hedges and vegetation, along with a cross section that explains the structure of the walls, the foundations, and the grading, if you look carefully. It's both a presentation drawing meant to impress and persuade his client, Louis XIV, to build it, but also it could be used to explain the work to his assistants and to the construction team. A magnificent drawing. Now, such technical devices of representation became utilized throughout Europe, and by the late 17th century, a profoundly influential institution, the École des Beaux-Arts, was established in Paris to assure the crown, its bureaucracy, and the various institutions they maintained a steady supply of trained architects, engineers, artists, and decorators. Several significant aspects of this institution entered the field of architecture. The atelier system of study, wherein a student would spend several years under a prominent designer, assisting them in their work while studying the history, the techniques, and the elements of architecture, and the presentation of project plans to a jury of academicians, which led to the more advanced students loading their boards onto small carts, which we call charrettes, and with the help of the junior students and assistants, rushing them to the courtyard of the Ecole to beat the submission deadline. The establishment of prizes also occurred, along with the most prestigious being the Prix de Rome, which sent a student off to live and work at the Villa Medici in Rome for three years, after which they were to return to France to enter practice and embark upon a career. Well, a principal feature of that called the Beaux-Arts pedagogy was the esquisse, or the sketch problem, two examples of which are shown here. These are timed exercises with a problem handed out to be due in a very brief period of time, say one day or 12 hours, or in the case of my classmates and myself, a century and a half later, 10 hours <laughs> from noon till 10 p.m. The object was to analyze a program quickly, decide upon a scheme, develop it, and then present it in plan, section, and elevation fully rendered with no verbal uh, description. It was intended to train one to produce work that had a strong concept and a clear formal idea and to graphically convey it effectively in support of the partie. The students were graded for their concept, their development, and their presentation. Well, what may seem most impressive today are the superb, often enormous watercolor renderings that were produced on heavy watercolor paper, their sheer size and their technical mastery. But one should also note carefully the nature of the architectural ideas and strategies expressed in renderings such as this. The sequence of spaces, their size and pacing from small to medium to large, and the articulation of the volumes, their purpose and their placement, all of which were fundamental to architectural theory of the day, especially that of the marsh or the experiences to be obtained if one were to move sequentially through a work of architecture. Well, one thinks of, no one really thinks of Frank Lloyd Wright as a Beaux-Arts architect. He thoroughly employed such strategies, however, in his working methods in part picked up from his master, his Meister Louis Sullivan, who had, st who had studied in Paris at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. This is a sheet of Frank Lloyd Wright's drawings that exemplifies this practice. It's of the Millard House in Pasadena, California, clearly done at one sitting. In the center of the plan, you can see the plan, 
right there, absolutely in the center of the drawing. Then he dropped some lines down from it, from that plan, and he created an elevation that's actually drawn over a cross section of a ravine that it sits in, from which he then pulled some lines off to the right of that lower piece and produced a side elevation. Well, just above that, you can see he was making some notes and a study of the massing of the twin piers on each side of the central volume. And then on the left, near the middle, is a study of the concrete block system that he's thinking of using, a kind of remarkable Mesoamerica-inspired tapestry block work that characterized the integral ornament found in a series of buildings he produced at that period. It's an inspired example of the esquisse method of study and composition. Renaissance and Beaux Arts ideas and techniques didn't just disappear in the modern era. They were absorbed, transformed, and repurposed for a different society for new compositional ideas, materials, and media. Here's a very large presentation drawing, a dramatic perspective and colored pencil on vellum by Frank Lloyd Wright for the Kaufman family summer retreat of Falling Water at Bear Run, Pennsylvania. But this is the earliest known drawing he made of falling water. He made it for himself, not the client. And in it, we can see him developing his idea of a set of smooth horizontal trays interposed with vertical masses and planes of stone uh, that, that the, where the trays are held away and above the rock ledges in the stream and the stone walls are anchored to those ledges. It's done with very simple orthogonal elevation but note that he's also making notes to himself of the thickness of the slabs and the resultant heights of the floors and the ceilings. This very straightforward orthogonal projection method is used extensively to study all sorts of things. You could describe this project, for instance, it's not limited just to architects, and, but also to used by engineers and industrial designers who employ the same devices, plan, section, and elevation. These are a couple of studies by Joseph Hoffman, the great Viennese architect, who also designed furniture, fabrics, and utilitarian subjects. There, the one on the left is a coffee pot, and you can see the one on the right is a soup spoon. Note how for the coffee pot, he's made several cross sections, one of the body of the pot, two of the curved handle, one, up near, the, one near the bottom and one at the top. Near, near. And then he's got a cross section, a little plan up there of the spout, above it, and then one of the knob at the top. And you can notice how they're all related in shape, giving a kind of harmony to the parts. Likewise with the spoon. Well, as I mentioned earlier, drawings are invaluable as a device of learning, especially for designers. As a young architect, Le Corbusier took several trips to see famous archeological and architectural sites in the Mediterranean, recording what he saw and thought in several of sketchbooks that have recently been reproduced in facsimile. Here we see a plan and a perspective sketch of the central forum in Pompeii with his notes about the parts that he made in October of 1910. These are some of his impressions of the Acropolis with the Parthenon from the same trip. First, it's seen from a great distance, then closer up there on the right. And then as he climbed up to the Propylaea, he noticed and sketched the small little temple of Nike that's perched out there on the right. Well, the cliche, the travel broadens one, is really based upon several simple truths. First, that because we learn from seeing, it's helpful for those who wish to design things to see as much of what has been done by others as is possible. In part, to assess things that have worked well or not, and to broaden your one's visual and artistic knowledge and vocabulary. If the Grand Tour was thought to be educational, a nice thing for the middle and upper classes, it was deemed essential for architects and artists who frequently recorded their travels and observations in sketchbooks. This remained true for modern architects as much as for those of earlier eras. And numerous facsimile publications have appeared recently to make this point. In these notes from a different sketchbook of an earlier trip to Germany and the Netherlands while he was still a student, Corbusier pays careful attention to color and its relationship to form and decoration, as well as to some details that caught his attention, such as this mechanism on the right for a movable panel with its wheel, its track. And you can see the his interest in the fabrication and the, and the mechanical fastenings. Well, several years later, in a series of projects from 1925 on, 
We can see Corbu using drawing as the principal means to study and to think about his designs, as well as to present it to his clients. Colors that he absorbed while he was traveling are invoked in this early white prismatic period of the Villa Garche and Stein and Villa Savoy. Other great modern architects made journeys to see and study historic sites and designs as well, which they also recorded in sketches. On the left are two pages from a sketchbook of Alvar Alto, looking down on the theater and, Apollo, and temple of Apollo while he was visiting Delphi in Greece. The measured detail of stone seats on the upper right is from the theater of Dionysus in Athens. In Athens. And the sketch of a fig tree he made in Egypt shows his interest in form and the relationship between shapes and curves of the branches and fruit. Well, Alto, like many or most superb designers, made countless design studies exploring ideas and forms, uh, structures, looking at reflexive gestures, such as he'd noticed, he recorded and he absorbed in the sketching over and over quickly and deftly. He put down one idea and then immediately developed it into a series of variations and alternatives. These are of a plan for a church he was working on with chapels. In the middle is a very first quick notion of a sectional idea. However, if you look carefully, you can see those little bounced diagonal lines. So while drawing the plan, he began thinking about a section. And the sectional idea is he continued to explore through additional drawings and studies, as you see here in that upper drawing. And then finally, they, he concluded on a shape that he liked and he began to work it out. And you can see it ended up becoming documented and built from the drawing that you see at the bottom. Well, another prominent designer of the recent past was the Italian Carlo Scarpa, who designed furniture, glass, fabrics, gardens, and buildings. I even own a couple of lovely knit ties of his design that I bought in Rome. He was a wonderful architect and a superb draftsman. There is a tradition in architecture of using cheap paper and soft media to try out ideas, eventually leading one to more finished products. These are two examples by Scarpa for a small office tower in Milan, which I'm convinced had an influence on Richard Rogers later, by the way. These are two of the many studies that Scarpa made for the Brion family tomb near Venice. They're made in colored pencil on tracing paper and they employ the convention that we saw earlier of, in Frank Lloyd Wright and others of drawing a plan and a section and sim simultaneously working from one to the other. In this case, as you see in the drawing on the left, there's an arching bridge shape that springs over a basin with a little island and it has some sculptural elements. You can see it in the plan below. Well, he also begins working on some details as you notice, if you look at the drawing carefully, he begins kind of while drawing one thing, he begins thinking about another. And he's so interested that the drawing on the right is a drawing for some of the structure for this project. And you can see the steel forms, the masonry forms above. And you can see what one of the things is that he's, he's interested in how, to, how things connect. And he focuses on particular parts of the drawing and other parts are left vague, but then he makes notes all around. So here you see a typical a front elevation looking straight at some columns with the beams above. And then to the right again, as usual, we see a section through what he's just drawn the elevation of and then trying to figure out the relationship of things in space. Now, this, what we have here is one of Scarpa's masterpieces. It's a museum he developed in the Castle Vecchio in Verona, where he made a series of Inter interventions within the shell of a historic structure that play off and against it, that emphasize its qualities while highlighting particular works of art in dramatic and a confrontational manner, such as this late medieval sculpture of an armor clad figure thrust out from a bomb damaged missing portion of the building fabric. And this is an early concept sketch for this particular element. Look how he uses a soft pencil to develop the idea of this L-shaped support. Now it's not yet clear to him whether it's of, to be of metal or of concrete. And he's exploring whether it should take the shape of a bent metal T, a, a T form, or as he eventually settled on an, an inverted channel shaped pier that turns 90 degrees into a cantilevered bracket. Also note the inclusion of a human scale figure in the section on the left and her line of sight toward the sculpture on the landing. 
Well, another early example of the evolution and thought of an architect in the 20th century is that of Lou Kahn, one of America's greatest architects of the late 20th century. I don't know why I said early, because he was one of the great late 20th century architects. Prior to moving from Yale to practice at teach in Philadelphia at Penn for the rest of his career, Lou spent several months at the American Academy in Rome. And while he was there, he took a life-changing trip to Greece and Egypt with two classical scholars, Bill McDonald and Frank Brown. A staunch modernist by then, Kahn took away from this trip an exciting vision of primal forms and light, stunning compositions and sequences, which he recorded in numerous sketches and drawings. Different individuals, of course, always find different things and different inspirations from the same material and situations. What Piranesi saw in the ruins of the bath structures at Hadrian's Villa in the 18th century that you see here on the left, fed into his interest in particular heroic aspects of Roman structures. But the strange drawing of Khan on the right, this wonderful drawing two centuries later is a playful and yet very powerful reconsideration of the romantic trope of picturesque fragments amid nature, a modernist interest in form and theater of collage and its evocative, if ambiguous, shapes. Well, each of us at various times finds find new things and stumble across situations that engage our thoughts and our response as we shift our interests. Eight years after returning from Team 10 meeting in Europe, after returning from Rome uh, and a Team 10 meeting in Europe, Lucan visited Albi in Southern France. It was knocked out by its massive brick cathedral and in the brief time he took to make this very scritchy sketch, he absorbed its incessant robust drum forms and the stunning effects that could be attained at such scale with humble terracotta bricks. And he was to use this motif subsequently to brilliant effect in many of his greatest works. In Kahn's sketchbooks, these typical inexpensive, convenient, lightweight, portable little devices, he simply employed a fountain pen and we can see him here developing ideas for numerous projects in this particular sketchbook. Here's examples for, of volumes, forms, and structures, whether they're from government, whether for religious worship, residential structures, there are, his notebooks are full of this. And this example that I'm showing you is of the Mikveh Israel Synagogue in Philadelphia. Well, while Khan and his staff built many study and presentation models like other architects, he continuously employed drawing as the fundamental medium from his earliest thoughts and explorations through study after study in charcoal on tracing paper, in pencil, and, in, and, and on solid paper, beautiful Watman paper. And he went from smudgy lines to precise lines, and finally to construction drawings. The charcoal, pencil, and pastel on the paper, however, were fast and soft and easy to manipulate, responsive to the touch. And eventually in these drawings of the Sauk Institute in La Jolla, the designs were recorded, as you see here, in superb pen and ink drawings on vellum and mylar. For Kahn, originally trained in the Beaux-Arts method under Paul Philippe Cray at Penn, Despite his embrace of modernism, the retention of Beaux-Arts study methods and the use of soft media allowed him to work quickly with one sketch over another and to change, to smudge, to overlay, to emphasize, seemingly pull form right out of the surface into physical presence as in these drawings for the Roosevelt Memorial in the East River, New York City. Drawings that are as dreamy as they are precise, powerful, and accurate. And this drawing on the left, you can see the sensibility of eyes and fingers at work with an appropriate shift in representation. Kahn's use of a carbon pencil on flimsy gives weight and feeling to the contrasting walls. One is set in a set of heavy masonry walls are in contrast with a conjoined wooden frame twin. And together they subtend this exterior room. By contrast, consider this carefully refined drawing of his for the fabrication of a wooden table with drawers. Notice that the plan is at the bottom of the sheet. Then there's a section elevation pulled directly above it. And then an enlarged drawing of the pair of X-shaped legs with a number of cross sections through the larger leg. And finally, there's a detail partway up on the right is of the drawer side showing how the bottom is to be led into the millwork section of, of the drawer. Well, 
How about this drawing? Here again, we can see the designer's mind at work, also demonstrating the enormous subjective flexibility of hand drawing versus drawing with a computer. It's a study by Kahn for an intimate area in a residence of a lower cozy seating area by a fireplace. And you can follow his pencil and follow his mind as he comes down the steps from the right. And then notice that there's a stale figure standing there that can't quite see over a floating cabinet he has put in. And with a set of shelves behind which is a, a bench, an upholstered seat, which is also floating. He'll figure out how to support them later. And they're facing a fireplace that is very briefly noted, except he does draw a large lintel stone and shows a few smaller stones up above in the chimney wall above it. But next he focuses on a very thin ledge between the, the seat and the fireplace that floats also above a recess for a wood alcove, which is a kind of mirror alcove to that of the, the, the actual fire box. And behind which is shown a very lightly sketched in is a tile mural that he's been thinking about. It occurs in another set of drawings at that time. And then there's some ceiling beams very loosely noted above. There's a shifting focus and attention from precise to vague or notional and of following thematic ideas around the drawing, the floating cabinet, the floating bench, the floating ledge, but shadows from each as well as from the beam overhead. Well, the number of modern designers who continued in, to travel and to find drawing as a medium for personal discovery and development is great. A few years ago, Michael Graves, who along with Charles Moore and Robert Venturi is credited with launching postmodernism, published a number of drawings and sketches that he made while at the American Academy in Rome and on travels as a young designer prior to his career of teaching at Princeton and developing a world famous practice. A recent graduate of the University of Cincinnati's College of Design, Art and Planning, here he is drawing in Rome, giving himself an education that cannot be obtained from slides and pictures and books by making his own recordings on, in the field in addition to various his, historic sites, of course. What did Graves do? He visited all the modern stuff he could see as well. And so here is a very nice loose sketch he did of the uh, Habitation de, de Unité in Marseille. Well, landscape architects also employ drawing for all the same reasons, to help them show, to slow down, to focus, to study things, to see and to analyze things, to learn and to develop their designs and their projects. These drawings are made by Larry Halperin, one of America's most influential landscape architects uh, of the 20th century. And he made these two in the Villa d'Este. They're from a number of intense and varied studies of the great hydraulic works that he was fascinated by and, and that later he was to uh, take to another level in a different way. Uh, but he was interested in their forms, their dimensions, how they worked, the various effects. Larry drew constantly and in a number of different ways, experimenting with representation. On the left is a drawing of his early McIntyre garden that combines a very straightforward plan with his walled garden and fountains, the pinwheeling runnels, and, but it's combined with an aerial perspective of the context of a meadow and trees and the view to the distant Oakland Hills. Well, on the right is a fairly, is a very frequently reproduced concept sketch from one of his uh, sketchbooks that has been published by MIT Press. Uh, for the very famous Sea Ranch development north of San Francisco. And it shows his ability to synthesize experience from walking observantly around on the ground into making a simple aerial perspective that he then annotates to explain organizing principles for development. Subsequently, Halpern took sketchbooks on numerous camping trips up into the Sierras on trails to into the Yosemite. There he recorded intense observations of the rocks, water, and its movement, the landforms with his pen and ink and brush. Well, you may be aware that he soon thereafter produced a series of public spaces and fountains, such as this influential one, Iris Fountain in Portland, Oregon. They're brilliant abstractions. They're not copies of the forms and processes he admired and studied and drawn. Like Kahn, his work was inspired and influenced by things he saw and in turn influenced designers around the world. Ada Louise Huxtable, the architectural critic for the New York Times, declared this work to be among the very best and most innovative of public spaces created since the Renaissance. So 
let me now share with you some of my own experience within this topic. Like some of my generation, I had an interesting education at the University of Washington with the faculty, half of whom were trained in the Beaux-Arts of Manor before World War II and half in a post-Bauhaus one after the war. Both camps believed in the importance and the craft of drawing as an essential to design at any scale. On the left is a portion of an analytique of a contemporary pavilion I made in one of my student projects. And on the other, the other drawings, of course, are later. There, I made those of the Fine Arts Building and Library for Emma Willard School while I was working in Edward Larrabee Barnes' office in New York in 1965. I am obviously a proponent of hand drawing and the utility of sketchbooks as a means of self-education, discovery, and pleasure. These are among the 170 sketchbooks or so that I've filled over the years. And they are, as you see, of various manufacture, size, and shape, bound in several ways and containing different paper. None are perfect, but some are favorites. And I purchase several at a time when I can find them. Now drawing is an act of the mind and of training the eye to see carefully and learning to record what one sees. And because we're all individuals, we're gonna see, think, and draw a bit differently. This is to be expected. After working through three years in the best architectural office in the country in the mid sixties, one of the best, I dropped out for a couple of years and lived first in a cabin on the end of Long Island and then in a cabin on Bainbridge Island in Puget Sound, drawing, painting, reading, and writing a bit. I question how a designer can learn running around taking a lot of pictures in a hurry, but I believe most certainly that sitting still and studying something so as to draw it, we actually may come to know a considerable amount. Drawings like these done quietly in the woods and on the beach at Bainbridge require time and patience, steady concentration and care, exactly the things that are needed in design. In 1969, near the end of my time out from architecture, I had a small studio in a former hotel below Pioneer Square in Seattle, where I became interested in the community of homeless and impoverished people who live there. The term skid road, by the way, originated there because logs were formerly skidded downhill to a sawmill. Well, two years later, I published a slim book on the subject of skid road. Drawing, I found, proved to be a good way to spend time there and to be accepted while recording a lot of detail and valuable information. I once showed up with a camera and was nearly attacked. Conversely, when I would simply sit and draw, I was accepted and was able to look and listen carefully, which was when I learned so much. Subsequently, I worked again for a time as an architect, but decided to travel and study landscape architecture abroad. In making the drawings that appear in Across the Open Field, my book on the English landscape, I wasn't merely interested in the views of the scenes. I was also recording structures and recurring patterns evident in the different places and materials at different scales, harmonies, as well as in the contrast and form and detail at different depths. The time invested in walking around, looking and drawing helped me to learn and think about the place and, to, and the forces that were at work. Okay, so I'm advocating learning by doing, learning by seeing. You must go see things for yourself, draw it for yourself, just lose your camera for a time. On several trips of my own to see and study greatly admired science and design icons while drawing, I, took, I could take note of their color, their form, their structure, their spatial arrangements, the materials, the dimensions, all this sort of information that's not gained while snapping a lot of photographs or surfing the web for potted history and disembodied images. There is no way that taking photographs, whether a high quality camera or with one of today's remarkable phones could have taught me as much as doing this sketch and making these notes in Greece. Pointing and shooting, turning and running onto the next for a hasty set of images will never inform the brain the way making this sketch did for me. One of the nice things about sketchbooks is that they're so flexible for recording information of all sorts. Here I noted the plan and principal features of the Campo Santa Maria Formosa in Venice, along with the notations of the pedestrian circulation, the diverse activities, and the life of the place. So much travel today is only tourism, people moving too fast, taking hundreds of useless images. It's no substitute for what happens when one stops, slows down, and spends the time to draw. Nearly all architects today know of Piazza San Marco in Venice, but have they taken the time to study the ratio of the height to the width of the pi piazzetta and made a note of it? Or take Place 
Furstenberg on the left bank in Paris, on, drawn here on the right. It's one of my favorite urban spaces in the entire world. Elegant in its proportions, its detail and its furnishings, it's simple yet rich. A perfect square, a cube of space with four polonia trees, one handsome light fixture. Well, since I've been studying it, three of these trees have been replanted and it goes on, it persists. It's a gorgeous urban space. I can draw it from memory because I drew it once very carefully. Drawings can be more analytical than many people realize. Consider these two popular tourist spots. The upper example is of the Fountain of Four Rivers by Bernini in the Piazza Navona, of course. I began drawing the base of the obelisk with its figures while noting the difference in scale between them and the crowd of tiny visitors around it. Then I did another drawing of it just to the right, showing more clearly the gesture of the pyramidal base with a carved void beneath the weight of the obelisk. And then I did an even smaller one just above that and a little to the left of how it was made from a stack of blocks. And finally, there's this tiny doodle of the twist, the torque of the whole ensemble. Well, the lower drawing is of Arezzo. And while I was really examining this great arcaded building by, Vars by Vasari that brings order to what is otherwise a cockeyed jumble of sloping pavement and disparate buildings, I began to reflect on how it restates the loggia that he executed at the Uffizi in Florence for the Medici and the relationship of both of those structures to Brunelleschi's fondling hospital of Santa Maria Annunziata. None of this would I have thought of if I hadn't sat down to make this drawing. Such record keeping and notation can be even more precise. There is no substitute for a well-made plan and a rendered section. For me, it was as much a matter of fun as it was useful to document Benedetto Arrigo's family estate in Tuscany at La Foce near Montepulciano. I made notes in the field, produced a survey, and then drew it up for the publication of a monograph on the villa published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. The plan on the right is a very large drawing made with Prismacolor pencils on Mylar, but the cross sections are colored pencil and sepia wash in a large horizontal format sketchbook called, appropriately enough, landscape format. <laughs> in 1933, 1953, start over, in 1993, let's get the right date, I was asked to come out to LA to look over the design for the J. Paul Getty Center in Los Angeles and to take charge of it where Richard Meyer was the architect. He had been working on it for some time when we were called in. So I flew out, went to the site, visited his office, and then went to the model shop. This is one of the number of sketches I made of a large wooden model that he had underway of the ensemble of buildings with the various proposed levels. Again, these helped me to understand the relationships and what was going on and where the, and they were much more analytical and helpful than a slew of photographs would have been for me. We then, I came back and with my staff and partners, we developed a number of studies in a very short period of time of various gardens and parts a number of which are seen here in one of our very early presentations to the Getty. They're colored pencil drawings on tracing paper, nothing too fancy, but very clear at a scale that the owner and the architect could see well and understand. But just before we were to fly out to LA to make this presentation, I realized that the audience might find the wealth of, of, of information and material to be a lot to take in all at once, that we had to, we had so much in our heads, there were so many parts and so many different places to the scheme that I would need some way to explain an underlying overall concept and how to look at the sequence of pieces. So I grabbed a copy of Shepard Angelico's pre-war monograph, Italian Gardens, and I threw it in my briefcase as I dashed out the door, along with a sketchbook as I went out the door of the airport. On the plane, I asked for a glass of water. I opened my sketchbook and I made this drawing. The upper cross section is a version of the rent, their rendition of the Villa Gambaria, and the lower one is my summary of the Getty Center landscape as I'd been developing it as I remembered it. And in the meeting, I just passed the sketchbook around and explained the Renaissance concept of three natures, that, which range from the most domestic and artificial through the utilitarian to wild nature, and of the analogies regarding the interrelationship between the spaces, the vegetation, the buildings, the indoors, and the outdoors. They all seemed to get it, and they allowed me to then walk them through the parts of the large drawings that were on the wall. Sometime later, I began to focus on one of the fountains that we presented that we'd proposed for the Central Museum Courtyard. My first thought, seen here in a watercolor from another sketchbook, was that it would be nice to present several large natural rocks 
boulders in a stone basin as a landscape composition. Maybe it would have mist or fog or some water, I don't know, jets, I, I didn't know yet, that would flow into a larger quiet basin. Again, I shared this with Meyer and with the museum director who encouraged me to pursue it. Well, the basin and rocks were finally eventually realized after a quite arduous process lasting over a year searching for the right stones. We finally located a trove of rocks that I was satisfied with up in the foothills of the Sierras near Yosemite and Sutter's Mill where gold was first discovered in California leading to the gold rush of 1849. They'd been pulled out of a pile of rubble in the woods near one of the near early mines. And you can see me here with a sketchbook making notes about particular rocks that I found the most interesting and suitable. A colleague is helping me measure their size and their general dimensions, which I then recorded. After this session in the stone yard, I began working in the same sketchbook with my field notes while I was flying back to Los Angeles from Sacramento. I did these drawings on the plane again. In these four pages, you can see me trying out several arrangements. In particular, arranging the ensemble around two versions of several large vertical stones, as well as the relationship of a, one particular horizontal stone that fascinated me in to the circular boundary. Working with these notes, we selected the stones I wanted, returned to the woods near Columbia, and arranged them as drawn in one of my last sketches. We created a full-size mock-up of the major features of the basin in composition with plastic sheeting, plywood, and water. And a few weeks later, John Walsh, the Getty Museum director, the head of the construction project and Getty's project manager flew up in a huge rainstorm and drove to the site in the woods to see it. I'd stuck my neck out pretty far and I needed their approval. Well, they approved it on first sight to my immense relief, following which, once again, working from my sketches, notes, and some key dimensions that we'd made of the mock-up, the stones were removed, taken to LA, and installed as per my sketches, which served for the as the construction drawings. It would have been foolish to try and document it more than that. The fountain is a commentary on the transformation of raw material uh, into art, in this case, California marble, which is not dissimilar to the travertine of Meyer's buildings or the marble used by sculptors for centuries. It's a piece of the natural world particular to the region. Such boulders as part of the glacial rubble and overburden that was stripped away by miners to get at the gold bearing sands and gravels beneath are also a piece of the history of California settlement. This design is also a commentary on the transformation of ideas from drawings into physical materials and then into construction itself. Note the relationship of the two stones at about five and six o'clock in the drawing and how they are exactly in the same place in relationship in the installation as in some of the early and more finished sketches that I had made. Well, it's not that we don't need and use computers in our office and projects. We do a lot with both simple ordinary programs as, as well as some fairly sophisticated ones and with large printers that go pretty constantly but they're almost exclusively used for production and promotion materials. Here is a person who has scanned a freehand design sketch and is translating it into a digital version, rather the way Frank Gehry and his employees scan and create digital models and documents from physical models, both sketchy ones and more finished studies that they produce. Well, we employ several kinds of drawing. This is a planned drawing that I made for an invited competition to redesign the grounds of the Washington Monument to protect it from a truck bomb attack after the 9-11 event. It was about 24 by 36 inches in size and made with colored pencils on mylar. These are computer drawings of the final grading and ha-ha wall details that we produce for presentation of the National Park Service and National Fine Arts Commission for their approval. However, this is the watercolor perspective I began at 2 a.m. <laughs> Uh, the night before our competition boards were due. Charrettes are hair raising events, even at my age. This rendering had nothing to do with computers. I constructed the view with a simple lead pencil on a very large sheet of watercolor paper, stretched it in the late afternoon. And later that evening, when the paper was ready and dry and it stretched, I, I did it quickly. It was fast and it was efficient. The surrendering made the assertion that after our proposal was implemented, it would seem as if nothing had happened, except that somehow the place and monument would look better than people remembered it from before. We won the competition, and that is what happened. 
We make use of drawings at every stage of a project, whether in developing the schematic design as here in a cross section representing structure, planting and program activities. The most useful drawings since Egyptian times have always been the plan and the section, simply because they are to scale. Everything has dimension and is in an exact measurable relationship vertically and horizontally to everything else. There's no fudging or wishful thinking, just facts and relationships. As landscape architects, However, we find the size of computer screens terribly limiting and often useless, inevitably finding ourselves in need to print things out at scales where we can actually see things. In this particular case, the site was 125 acres, unlike buildings that are often relatively smaller and can normally be seen in whole or large portions on a conventional screen. We work with drawings whatever size seems required and whatever we feel we need to understand things. Commonly in the concept phase of design for some things such as this project to update and improve a humble bench, we make full-size drawings prior to building mock-ups and going into final documentation. Here are examples where we've gone from small freehand drawings that you can see um, to uh, larger computer drawings. And then we've worked over those and made corrections and improvements by hand over the digital ones. Another example of this interplay between the computers and freehand is this critique of a draft Photoshop perspective made by one of my employees. It was made, this critique was made very quickly in pencil on a tracing paper overlay explaining how to make the digital view better, how to purge the for hire rental rendering character that's common to a majority of architectural renderings today that invariably have too much detail, too much sharp focus at an inappropriate distances, too much chroma, too bright, they're too brittle, rather nasty quality with stock figures and kind of thin generic details. Well, the subsequent computer rendering produced by our staff is not bad, but it still has several of the faults common to computer renderings that softer gestural, less complete and less precise analog drawings don't suffer from. Computers and programs for architectural drafting arrived in America's offices in the mid 70s. And within a decade, their use was widespread in major corporate offices leading to scenes such as the one on the left that I found in a large contemporary architecture office in Chicago. It's a portrait of a factory in an industry, not of a creative environment. I didn't see a single drawing board on several floors. In a meeting with some of them, when I asked for some tracing paper, they couldn't find any. On the right is our office. It's somewhat different. This clearly isn't much of a factory nor organizer on some idea of efficiency and maximum use of employees per square foot. It's a design studio. Make no mistake, neither my partners nor I would argue against the use of current technology. Computers are fabulous tools like telephones, espresso machines, or nail guns. We have a group of very tech savvy people as well as oodles of pencils and paper and a diversity of places to work. For us, Drawing can be a communal and collaborative event or a means of having a focused conversation about a project or a particular aspect of design or a solitary activity where an individual explores ideas and their implications. This particular doodle was one of many that I made for a site design of the status center at MIT that we built with Frank Geary. Now, some architects like Frank use models the way my partners and I use drawings in sequential iterations and studies. Um, you can see his office, you know, is really just a big studio workshop. And, but when we meet together, it's invariably at a table where we talk with each other with and through drawings, as in the record of a recent conversation on the lower right that one of our staff grabbed after a meeting to make a record, or in this large image of Frank and one of his young architects, Dana McKinney, sitting where we have been working together for several hours on a large master plan project. That we work this way is seen as quite valuable by many of our colleagues. Not long ago, while preparing a presentation for the Philadelphia Museum of Art Master Plan that we'd been working on for several years, Frank called me up and said, hey, Lori, can you do one of those nice big hand drawing colored plants you make? Well, so we did. There is no question that we have found computers and a number of graphic programs a godsend. It would have been a nightmare to keep track of and compute the horizontal and vertical situation of 2,600 concrete steles in the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin that we worked on with Peter Eisman without several common programs such as Rhino. But at the same time, 
I can't imagine a better or easier way to have studied the complexity and materiality of the transition from within the field of the memorial to the public sidewalk and street opposite the tear garden that these quick sketches show that I did by hand. Well, the whole point of this talk has been to argue for the efficacy of drawing as a particular and remarkably useful tool for designers. Nothing since we came out of the caves has proved better at helping us capture a fleeting thought about physical reality. And nothing since the development of paper, pen, and pencils has been more useful and flexible, regardless of the personality and ideas of those using them. There's been a fair amount of talk about the death of drawing and a certain amount of triumphalism regarding the magic of computer modeling, of visualization, of animation fly-throughs, and now VR. For many students and young designers, a belief has developed that hand drawing is passe and not worth doing. Sadly for them, it seems true. I say sadly, not because they will be unemployable, they'll probably get jobs of some sort, but because I have doubts about how not being able to draw will limit their design ability and ultimately their engagement with the real world and the effect upon our built environment from the work and products they may make and their ability to satisfy our innate desire for aesthetic pleasure in the world of our making. Even so, in my last years of teaching at Penn, I found a great number of our students were eager to take drawing courses and use hand drawing on field trips and in their studio work. I'm confident that wherever they end up doing, whatever they end up doing, it's a skill that they'll be glad they have and that it will give them pleasure. Well, this year with the COVID-19 pandemic, a number of students have mournfully expressed their frustration that they can't travel or go to Europe like I did. I have replied to them, but I didn't learn to draw in Europe. <laughs> I learned to draw here at home before I went. So these are drawings that I made while an architecture student uh, it's still in, at the University of Washington. On the right is a Russian church at Naknek on Bristol Bay where I was working one summer. And on the left is a city hall in Tombstone, Arizona where my parents had moved from Alaska. There's a lot of architecture all over our country worth drawing and studying from the nearly anonymous Victorian buildings in older parts of most American cities, like the one on Skid Road in Seattle here, to modern works of the 20th century, such as Philip Johnson's own house in Connecticut, or works like those of Louis Sullivan in Chicago, seen here in sketches I made, analyzing the units and rhythms of the composition for the base of his auditorium building, or where I unrolled his bronze metalwork entrance design for Carson Peary Scott building to discover the organizing bones of a Renaissance composition with its motifs worthy of Palladio or Giulio Romano. Finally, I've told my students for years, there are people wherever you are. You really should try to draw them wherever you are. Study them, because after all, they're who your future work will be for. So I'm going to close with a self-serving uh, moment. Like all talks, this is going to vanish into the ether like the Cheshire cat. But let me point out two of my most recent books from Oral Press, Be Seated and French Sketchbooks, both of which present a number of my thoughts about drawing. The first is a history and discussion of public seating in the West from numerous examples, including work from our office. And the second is a record of drawings made in France over a period of 50 years that show how a designer like myself looks at places and things and learns from the world around them by taking the time to look carefully and by drawing it. I've currently begun the next volume, Italy Sketchbooks, although there are 45 years worth of sketches I have to pick from. The book is going to take a little longer than any of the sketches did. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to join you here today. We're done. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Laurie. You're welcome. Mary Beth. Laurie, we're going to get to some questions. If you want to stop um, your screen share just so we can see. Okay, where I'll stop at. sharing. Hi. Okay, we're back. Um, okay, so if anybody else has any questions, feel free to submit them. Um, I'm going to start um, with mm. one uh, that I was asked to to read. Right now, we have more comments than questions, but hopefully, oh, um, questions. oh dear. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. The the first comment um, is a little bit of a challenging issue, but. Um, it's from an anonymous uh, attendee about okay. um, essentially, um, do you have any experience or any um, reference points of, of drawings from other non-Western cultures? So from Asian or African background and, and how, um, how does drawing look or change across different cultures? Well, I, I purposely tried to keep it simple. Yeah, I, I, I'm very fond of uh, 
Asian art, particularly Japanese and Chinese, and I spent a lot of time looking at uh, it. And I have a, another lecture on that topic. But but the truth is that um, the my favorite, some of my favorite drawings in the whole world are are from the uh, uh, some of the earlier hand scrolls from uh, the Song Dynasty. They're unbelievable. But uh, the 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 graphic, the prints of the late 19th, uh, late 18th, early 19th century in Japan are also on the Hokusai and all those stuff. I mean, unbelievable, Hiroshige. So there's, they had a huge influence upon, you know, Western art and architecture, as you all probably know, and the student must know, obviously. <laughs> and uh, that's another topic, but the answer is yes. And I am a huge enthusiast for uh, particular artists and uh, and periods of certain Asian uh, art. I don't know if that answers the question, but... but I think um, so. They also mentioned um, examples from, from women throughout history, like Julia Morgan, um, whose sketchbooks, I guess, are at the California Polytechnic um, uh -huh. University Archives. Right. Um, well, yeah, there's sketchbooks everywhere. It turns out once you scratch the subject, you know, it's a, the, the interesting thing is uh, there are sketchbooks of Hokusai, by the way, you know, where, where he was doing a lot of practice of figures and animals and stuff. It, it, it's, a, it's This is not a thing limited to just a, a few of us in the West. Um, Natalie Pratt, I saw you had your hand raised. I don't know if I, you want to unmute and ask a question. Hi, hello. Okay, well, we'll give her a minute and see. Um, in the meantime, I will move on. Um, again, I, I am getting way more comments than questions. Mostly oh just dear, I'm sorry. No, no, this is good. They're saying that they're very inspired and they uh, well, appreciate your talk. They're all good comments. Well, it's kind of as Coles and Newcastle, I realized after we were talking about it, it's your current curriculum. <laughs> That's okay. Um, the one comment is that over the last two decades, um, it must be one of our alums has noticed a distinct lack of sections in construction drawings um, and thinks that they were very helpful how to understand relationships and how things go together. So I guess from there, I would extrapolate a question that have you noticed that over time as people have moved more towards um, computer assisted design, are there things that you miss from when more people were doing hand drawing? I do. And I found that working with a series of architects uh, offices across the country, both in Europe and here, that some young architects uh, quite often, they think that when they're working in Revit or something, they're actually uh, working carefully and they're not. They don't know where anything is. <laughs> and if I try, I just said, just send me a section. I want to know where this is and what that dimension is. And they actually have a hard time. And, and they're a bit lost in space, uh, frankly. And so I, I have found this to be a problem with a, a, a generation of people who haven't been trained in the, about how to construct a set of drawings and put them together, you know, which I didn't really address today, but it was implied by, by harping on, the, on the, the method of plan section and elevation with the details, et cetera. But the answer is yes, if that was a question. Um, Anne Northrup, do you want to unmute to ask your question? Yes, I can read it. Um, Hi. Hi. Uh, my question is, how do you balance recording impressions of a place or perhaps the mood or experience created with uh, factual and analytical information about it? Um, well, clearly you can go do research or you, you know, drawing and looking at something doesn't tell you everything about the history of anything. Uh, it, it can t you can learn a lot if you're a Sherlock Holmes <laughs> or if you've been drawing and studying a long time. But I just feel that one... Uh, you need both. You, you need to read and you need to know where you are and you need to, but you also need to look more carefully because there's a lot of repetition of things that are not deeply founded in reality. Uh, for instance, the history of English landscape was uh, wrong for, you know, a hundred years because people kept saying, oh, it was derived from paintings of Claude Lorraine. And it wasn't, it was actually derived from real gardens and real parks in Italy, but people didn't know because they didn't go see them and they, uh, and they were just copying other historians. So one wants to read as much as you can, uh, but you want to read it critically and you, you need to compare it with, you know, life on the ground and in the field. Um, and when you're in the field, quite often you'll see things that make you wonder about things that you want to then go read. And so 
the, you know, balance is hard for all of us to get in our lives, but it, you can try. I try. Thank you. Um, William. Well, Willard. let me just say one, one last thing on that. And I'll just say that um, I'm quite unabashed about just writing on the, you know, drawing and writing on the same page. I, I just feel it's all notes. It's all grist for the mill. Yeah, I'm not doing the, I don't set out to make them be works of art. And so that's why I can sometimes just write all over them. I don't mind it. It's okay. That actually leads into a, another question um, from a, another anonymous person. But how long do your sketches take normally for you when you're on site? It really depends. <laughs> the watercolors take longer because you need the certain pieces to dry before you do other pieces quite often. Um, the, the more elaborate drawings sometimes take up to an hour, um, maybe an hour and a half for a couple of the really over overdrawn ones. But the the quick ones, you know, they're still 10 to 15 minutes, you know, sometimes that, I mean, we love the idea of the quick sketch, but quite often the thoughtful sketch takes a little bit longer. So, you know, traveling with me is a difficult for some of my friends and family because I quite often will just plonk down somewhere and be there for an hour or so. Uh, and, you know, that that's hard on other people, but if it's taking you more than an hour and it's not a watercolor, you may be doing the wrong thing. You're overdrawing. <laughs> Another um, comment question is uh, David had said that he enjoys the idea of a portable world um, of information that you carry in your sketchbook. Uh, and that's something he agrees with. But at what point did you personally move to watercolor as an additional medium in your sketchbook? Oh, well, um, I've been doing watercolors since I was in high school, but I didn't start doing them in the sketchbooks until, no, I don't know, it's like 10 years or so after I'd been doing the, you know, I, I would guess I didn't start doing watercolors in the sketchbooks till hmm, probably the 1980s. Yeah. Well, I know that's before most of you were born, but that's, I'm sorry. But for me, that was, that was I'd already lived, you know, 40 years by then, so. <laughs> Uh, William Wilmack, did you want to unmute to ask your question? Uh, Stefano um, should break in when he wants to also, if he, if he thinks he's not getting, a, I'm not giving a good enough answer to the students. Go ahead. I, I just had a, uh, hello, thank you very much for your lecture. I'm very inspired by, oh, by seeing your work um, and your, in your lecture in general. I was just curious, um, with so many collections of drawings and sketches that you have, do they have a home going forward in the future? Um, you know, one yes. day will they be housed at a museum or a- yep. No, no, I can tell you. Um, they're all being given to the University of Pennsylvania archive. Uh, it, that's already a, an agreed thing. I'm just keeping them here because I'm still working with them. Um, but they have a lot of stuff of mine already and they're gonna get some more. It's a, the archive where Khan's, all of Khan's work is, it's where Venturi's work is, it's where, uh, Larry Halpern's work is, it's where, it's a great archive, um, like the one at, at Berkeley and like the one at Harvard. And, you know, you know there are many great schools have great archives, uh, Columbia. So, but th they're all going to, they're all going to Penn and they will all be, you know, available for, you know, study and, and that sort of thing. But people are going to have to push me out of the way first. <laughs> that won't be easy. Yeah, okay. As a, a follow-up question to that, um, Chris Wilson. The young, I'll just say this young person will, he will live to be able to do that though, you see. We'll get out of this COVID and he, he's gonna, you know, he may never catch up with me, but he'll, I'll, I'll be gone and he can go see the books. <laughs> Back to the next question. Um, we have a strong sense of how your analysis of the world flows from your eye and, into, and hand into your sketchbooks, but can you talk a little bit about how in design your creative ideas flow from your mind onto the page and then out into the world? Wow, wow that, that, that's a tough one. Um, well, uh, see, think, draw, <laughs> Just, I don't know. Um, there's, sometimes it goes quickly and smoothly and sometimes it takes a long time um, and then it's not easy and it's not, it's iterative. But what happens is um, the, the sketchbooks are often unrelated to the work unless I have a particular problem, like I showed you the stuff from the Getty. Um, uh, often, there's an awful lot of the work that I've done that is actually just done in the office. It isn't you know, the sketchbooks because you'll, but I almost always, well, everybody should go to the site P 
period when you begin a project. And I almost always go to the project to a site and make some notes and, and do some sketches. That That's common. Then one comes back and shares those with some of your colleagues and your staff and, and you get a hold of whatever you're working on, the base drawings, and you start thinking about the program and you start thinking about the ideas. And, but then you actually start a new set of drawings and that new set of drawings are the studies for the project. And it's only sometimes that during the project, you'll be traveling and you use the sketchbook and then you bring the notes back and you immediately copy them and hand them to somebody who's working on something and you talk about it. And so, so that there is an iterative back and forth process with the sketchbooks, but at a certain point, they're kind of behind you and the work is in front of you and, and you're working in the office with other people uh, on larger drawings more carefully um, and you're producing you know, reports or you're producing presentations, you have to go show other people, your clients or contractors. And so at a certain point, the sketchbooks are long back in the past. <laughs> You know, okay. I hope that answers the question. I think so. The, the how ideas flow out of a person's head, though, Lord knows that's this is many different ways as people, probably. We have a question from a professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Oh, hi. Yeah, hi, hi, uh, Professor Olin. Um, I, I loved your presentation, everything you said, uh, rings so true and uh, really wonderful. Uh, I, I love what you've done and what you do. Um, I, one question I had, you know, with, and other people have spoken about this too, where, um, such as Daniel Liebeskin and others, mm -hmm. where they lament the lack of drawing skills and so many of architect, uh, architecture students uh, that are out today. Mm -hmm. um, what, in your experience, motivates or convinces your, let's say, newest employees or youngest employees um, of, of the value of hand drawing from observation and, and drawing from the imagination? Well, that's a, hi, it's a wonderful question. Um, I'm not actually sure I know the answer, but I will say that um, people who come to our office kind of expect, they know that we, have a lot of computers, but they also know that the value that our office has had historically placed upon uh, graphic representation and drawings and hand drawings. And so there's a lot of young people in our office who actually keep sketchbooks, uh, who do draw a lot. Almost everybody at some point draws in our office, either as part of a team on something or individually. But they also uh, have started a, from time to time, they will have a uh, a sketch club will start and then they it'll go for a month or two and then everybody is so busy working that it kind of falls apart and then a few weeks later someone will ask to draw again but i they the people have quite often have asked me to talk to them about it and give them crits but but most of the people in the office value it and, but i would say that and and the students i've had at both at harvard penn uva various places um they, some of them come toward you and some of them don't. <laughs> you know, they, they're, some of them are afraid of it. They shouldn't be, but they're afraid of it because they don't, they're afraid that they are not going to do very well because they feel like they're having to start from the beginning. And that's the sad part because I really do believe anybody can learn to draw. I just don't, you know, they're not all going to get the same place. And some people are starting from, you know, where they, when they stopped in third grade or second grade, that's where they start <laughs> and you have to take them from there, but you can move them along really very fast in a, in a course of a semester. I could do it. It wasn't that hard, um, yeah. but uh, they have to have, be interested and believe that it has utility. And that's, that's where, you know, they separate these days, I think. Um, you I know, know. I, go I ahead. Found, I found that, um, surprisingly, at least surprisingly to some, that many students actually love the process of oh, hand yeah. drawing. When no, we go do. out in Chicago and draw historic, beautiful spaces and mm -hmm. spend two hours or two and a half hours just drawing that, mm -hmm. it slows everyone down, yeah. makes them think you really see something when you draw it that you don't see right. when you snap a phone, a phone picture. Absolutely. Uh, 
And so you're so right about that. It, it's so uh, valuable. And I think contrary to thinking today that everyone's enamored of only digital uh, fantasies. I think uh, that's passing. Value. Well, I think, I think what's happened is now that everybody can do it and they're doing it since they were in fifth grade or something like that, um, the, the, it's, it has an attraction like, oh, there's this other thing, you know, I could learn that. And I found that when I, I, I offered a drawing course at, at 9 a.m. on Monday morning, and it was like, oh, my God, who would do that? But the, it was oversubscribed always because people thought, what a great way to start the week. You know, all I have to do is be able to get there. And, you know, and of course, if we would start in the winter indoors where nobody could draw outdoors and it was cold, but also I needed them to learn to start with still lives and drawing each other and doing stuff like that until they got a certain level of skill. And then as the semester went on, the weather got better and better and we went out and then it just got better and better. And then we began to go to the cemetery, we'd go to the train station and we'd go out on the campus and, you know, they just loved it, you know, and I, they, and they were always dumbfounded by how good they were by the end of the term. And they had this wall full of drawings, you know? So anyway, next, <laughs> thank you. So the, the last question I have, and then Steph knows if you have any final comments is from a student, um, Bailey, um, who asks, what do you recommend to students who often have difficulties creating legible on-site sketches? <laughs> Slow down, take your time, do one thing at a time, start somewhere and work your way across the page. I mean, the, the panic of the empty page, what happens is you look out and the world is so full of information and you look down at the page, there's nothing there. The thing is do something, put a few marks down. And as soon as you put them down, you'll realize what's wrong with them or where they are. And then you begin to adjust everything to it. And you just, just, you know, do one thing and then do the thing next to it and then do the thing next to it. And pretty soon you will have made something, you know, it's, it's like the fear of starting the, that you're going to make a mess. Well, it's okay. You know, the first drawing is always ugly. Try the next one, you know, and, and don't be afraid to say, Oh, I'm, I'm starting over. I'm just going to do another one, you know, and do the same thing over again. Don't get up and go somewhere else. Okay. I try that. Just be brave. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Laurie, for an extraordinary lecture and for great, great, great answers to questions. I want to ask a pedagogical question before we oh, end. Okay. Um, you've been at it for a long time, for a really long time. So th there are two issues that, that we are facing in the school as we're trying to refine our own curriculum. One of them is, uh, what is the balance between uh, learning to draw by hand and learning to draw by computer in the course, in the course of, a, of a curriculum? Where does one begin? What one does one be, how does one balance these two exposures to, to media over a five year period, for instance? That's one question. Mm -hmm. The other question is, what is the balance? Be, I'm not thinking about people. No, I, I have an idea about how to answer that, so we'll come yeah, back but, to that. But let me get in, uh, the second question because they're related. And the second question is, well, you started in high school, uh, but others arrive in the school without ever having drawn out of a propensity or a thought that they wish that's common yeah. that comes from another perspective. So um, how does one balance in a five-year curriculum the, the, the um, tension between learning to draw and learning to design? Now, that actually goes to the core of, your, of the title of your lecture, but you, your lecture in a way is addressing uh, the act of uh, these two things being one after one is relatively fully educated. How mm -hmm. does it actually get to the point of being able to do this? What okay. is first, what is second? How are they combined over, over five years? Both of these are five-year questions. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know your studio sequence and your support courses, but um, this is a problem that every school I know has had, and not very many of them have done what I would do. <laughs> and that is, I think you probably need to do, you need both, you, they need to come out of school being employable, which means they need to have a certain number of computer skills to a certain level, period. Um, so that means they probably need at least two plus years of actually using the computers to make something, different things. And, but in order to draw, you, you, if, especially if they're starting from, you know, like a second grader and you know where they left off when last they were had a coloring book or something uh, they're going to need 
to do it. And the only way you learn to draw is by drawing and doing it a lot. It's like to, to learn to play an instrument or to learn to do anything, you need to actually practice a lot. And, you only, and the more you do, the better you get. And if you don't do a lot, you won't get better, period. So that means I would say that what we did with people in my class who came in who didn't have the, a kind of background like I did, uh, it started in the third year of the five-year curriculum. And we drew, <laughs> we actually drew every day for the next three years, pretty much in different ways. We, we had actually, what, there was a course that we had uh, where we had to draw first from plaster casts, and then we drew from life, and then we drew outdoors. It was a three three quarters, you know, was, and and that year. But then the next year, uh, we they added watercolor, and that's when we did the analytics, and we began doing the sketch problems for the next two years. And we did sketch problems every Wednesday, period. Just, and you didn't have to do them all. It's just you needed a certain number of points by the end of the year, or you couldn't advance. And they were very hard to get because they didn't give out very many points ever. <laughs> and so you're really better off to do a lot of them and get better at it. Um, so one of the things is that I think I, if I were doing it these days, I think I would start with some, uh, at least by the second studio year, if you have four studio years, I would have a drawing, some kind of required drawing segment uh, that goes to the next three years. And at about the same time, I'd, put them on the computers. I would, I would have them doing both and not doing one first and then the other one second is always going to fail. I think you need to be doing both of them. Uh, and, and, but not overloading one or the other. They both take time. Uh, I would, the thing that happened to us was they would have us make something with our hands and then they would make us draw it. <laughs> if we built a structure, we would draw it. If we, you know, if we were doing a design, we had to draw it. So and everything we did, there was always a drawing component. And then sometimes there would be presentation requirements of this or of that. So that it was always plugged into the, in order to do something else, you ended up having to make another drawing of some sort. And then they were different sorts, you know? So, so it was, it just became part of the, the water, part of the background of doing the design. So that it wasn't seen as separate from the design. Okay, it's it's like Ian McCarg once said, "Fish will be the last creature to discover water." Well, I, I think the notion that that if you're swimming in in design, you should also be swimming in drawing of different modes. And so I think uh, you know, I, I the problem is that when we put too much weight on one thing, it it people either break under the weight or they that's all they end up knowing how to do or they resent it or something happens. So I think it has to be a, some kind of a shared thing that is not too precious and it's not too, it is, doesn't seem too burdensome. It's just part of doing business, you know? It's like, you know, it's like you do the dishes after, after every meal. Well, you know, you should draw for every design. You know, and that, and then at different times the requirements change. This time we have to do it this way. This time we have to do it that way. I mean, after a while, the student, and then there's the certain projects where the student has the choice. We, it was only at a certain point that we were ever allowed, and I did this with my students at Penn, uh, allow them to choose their medium, whatever you want, choose your sizes. You know, you you figure out how to present present the project because after you leave this school. Dad's not going to be there to tell you how to organize your drawings or tell you what medium to use. You better start figuring it out. What's the best way to explain the thing that you're trying to design? Sometimes it's in a model with just a few support sketches. Sometimes it's in an elaborate set of drawings with a sketch model. It depends. I hope that answers your question. Well, that's a very excellent uh, response. Thank you, Laurie. And one last question before we let you go. So tell us about the next five years for you. Ah, uh, well, uh, <laughs> um, as I hinted, uh, I, I actually have a, I'm starting a couple of books. There's one book in press right now, which is a collected, is a selection of essays that should be out in October. Then I, I'm starting, I've actually started work on the Italian sketchbook, which uh, I'm looking forward to. Oro Press wants to have it be a series. The third one will be America, you know, 
you know, Alaska to Mexico, East Coast to West Coast. Just, you know, we'll stop there. We're not going to do, you know, Asia or, or, or the rest of Europe, although there's a lot there. Um, so one, the next book, and that'll take Pablo uh, Mandel, the designer for these books is in Buenos Aires. He's a wonderful designer and a musician and all kinds of stuff. Pablo and I were hoping to get together on that book, I would say, in midsummer and get it going. So it'll be done within a year. That's the Italian book. I've written pieces of it and the drawings, of course, exist. Um, then I've been asked, I've been asked to do, it's not an autobiography, actually. It, it's more of a monograph on some of the key projects that I've done and talk about them from my point of view. But the person who asked me to do that said, and also, could you do the first half of that book about how you became the kind of landscape architect you are? I thought, oh, that, that's, a, that's a tough one. I think that's going to take a couple of years. But I've started and I've written a ton of stuff that I'm going to throw away on that one. Uh, but that, that'll, you know, again, the work exists. It's just what, what she said, what the editor said to me was that, um, she said, well, you know, we keep waiting and when people die, then somebody runs around and tries to figure out what they thought. You know, she said, maybe we should just ask them while they're still around. What did you think? So, so that's why, you know, and because yes, of course it'll be self-serving and it's course the world through my, you know, the world according to Laurie Olin, but uh, that will at least be something. And then other people will have their ideas anyway, you know, but at least they'll know what I thought. So the, those two books are, I shall say underway and going to take a few years. But I also would like to, um, uh, well, then the third one, if I get to that, that's another book out there. But I don't feel like people keep asking me to do things, but I don't want to go on trying to, I've, I've done so much. You know, I had 40 years before I was a landscape architect. I've had 40 years as a landscape architect. I don't think I'm going to get another 40, but, but, I, would, but I would like to have a next chapter where I could draw and paint a lot more than I have because of the travel. Because as I kept saying, and as you point out, and the man from the Art Institute says, you got to sit still, you know, you got to slow down to paint, you, know, you can't, and you know, if, if you use a medium beyond watercolor, then you're, you're tied to a lot of other apparatus, you know, if I go pick up oils again, or something like that, which seems like, oh, God, that would be trouble, but I love the smell. <laughs> so more, more writing, uh, some books, travel, um, and uh, then I think drawing, I'd like to just go sit and draw, <laughs> see the world. It's a good way of being in the world, of being there. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. It was a Thank you, Steph. This evening. And, uh, you know, with the pandemic's uh, end in sight, we, we'd hope to have you come and see us and spend some time with us in the future. Oh, I'd love to. You'd okay. Very much invited. And very much Thank you. Welcome. We Thank should you. meet in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Take care. Okay. Thank Everybody. you. Bye-bye. See you. Bye.